This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. We talk a lot on this show about lines on maps and how decisions made centuries ago about where to place a line can have incredible consequences today. But I don't think that any one straight line has made as much of an impact on the world as the one drawn on June 7th, 1494. On that day, Pope Alexander VI drew a vertical line down the crude map of the New World, straight through what we know as South America. The western half was given to the Spanish, and the eastern half to the Portuguese. The Spanish side would today become what we would all call the majority of Latin America, with nations like Mexico, Colombia, and Venezuela. The eastern half, though, became what is known today as Brazil. A vibrant nation of 211 million people, the home of Carnival, the Samba, and the largest rainforest in the entire world. But also home to the lawless Flavelas, a booming drug trade, a fluctuating economy, and a police force where 1 in 23 arrests ends in death. Geographically, Brazil has everything required to become a world power and the breadbasket of the world, but what's holding them back? Why does the nation of Brazil always seem perpetually on the cusp of becoming one of the world's superpowers? But to answer that question, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. A Dirty Car Wash so yeah, imagine a, a, a settler colony basically, which historically um, differed quite a bit from uh, their Spanish-speaking neighbors. Um, what also many people don't know in the US and in Europe is that actually Brazil rece uh, received much more slaves than the United States did. So the port of Rio alone, I think, received four times more slaves than uh, the entire uh, region, which is nowadays the United States of America. So you've got quite a history of oppression going on in a country and racism going on in a country with uh, legacies that last until today. Dr. Christoph Harig is a research fellow at the Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg, specializing in security issues surrounding Brazil. He's also written a number of fantastic papers on the subject and is an expert on the Latin American theater. He joins us today. I can't summarize the whole history, let's just stick to mid 20th century to here, um, where you've had a military that's often intervened in politics uh, when they f thought it suited them. So for instance, they overthrew the empire and created a republic and overthrew presidents and created a military regime, the last one which lasted from 1964 to 1985. And uh, their political pro protagonism lasts until today, and especially under Bolsonaro, they have refound a role of pretty pronounced political protagonism. To give it a bit of context here, what was Brazil's role during the Cold War? Was it on the American camp, or was it in the Russian camp, or was it simply just unaligned? Where did Brazil sit in this overall theater? Yeah, so during the Cold War, well, just again, beginning in the Second World War, the uh, Brazil joined the Second World War, um, other than most Latin American countries, Brazil joined the Second World War on the side of uh, the United States and had a, had a role in, in Italy and then was more or less aligned with the US. Uh, when then in the early 1960s, these um, president, president Goulart tried to install a uh, or try to push through some sort of more social democratic policies. Um, there were fears among Brazilian conservative elites and the US diplomatic uh, establishment that Brazil might switch sides and become more of a part of the Soviet um, sphere of influence, which obviously isn't that straightforward. But then the, the United States supported um, forces within Brazil, namely uh, the military, who overthrew that government and established a military dictatorship, military regime that very clearly sided with the US and other military regimes in the region against leftist groups, leftist, leftist forces. And uh, I think most of your listeners will know about Operation Condor, the uh, 
cooperation of different Latin American countries um, seeking out and punishing leftist insurgents across the region. So they very clearly sided with the US in that uh, Cold War epoch. With the Brazilian economy, you tend to notice these huge fluctuations in the market. Brazil goes from record highs to terrible lows, back to record highs and then to terrible lows again. What causes this volatility in the Brazilian market? So that what you refer to is also called the chicken's flight. So they do have a problem, or let's say they're very focused on exporting raw materials. And despite having a huge market for themselves. They, the economy still depends very much on uh, prices for raw material on the world market. So for instance, um, during the 2000s, Brazil made a lot of money with oil and the discovery of uh, oil promise to um, guarantee further income uh, or guarantee more stability in terms of the economy. But then oil prices crashed and all that focus on these raw products again led to nothing. So Brazil nowadays exports lots of soybeans, uh, of soy to, to, to China, for instance. But that whole value producing chain isn't actually taking part in uh, taking place in Brazil. Much like many of the other South American nations, Brazil experienced the famous pink wave. Can you take us through what that is and how it affected South America? Well, the pink wave was actually a a wave of... um, It's also like the chicken flight you mentioned earlier in terms of economics. Um, The pendulum often swings between rather conservative governments and uh, rather leftist governments. And the 2000s were a decade where you had mostly left-leaning social democratic or more far-left governments like in Venezuela, which kind of... um, promised a change to previous policies of previous decades when you consider that almost all of South America was governed by military regimes in the 1970s. So that was quite a pronounced change. And in Brazil, uh, which was kind of the protagonist of the pink wave, in Brazil that led to significant changes in terms of economic policies like the Zero Hunger Program, the Bolsa Familia Program, uh, which were subsidies to poor families, conditional upon uh, school visits of children. So uh, Brazil in the 2000s managed to to reshuffle wealth in a certain sense, but not to the extent of a a radical project. Uh, The rich were also growing richer in Brazil during the 2000s in the pink wave, but they managed to include poorer sections of the society into sectors of the economy they weren't able to take part before. Um, But that was based on consume. So it was based on consumer goods. It was um, the poorer sections of society, the poorer classes were, weren't actually able to take part in uh, some social classes that still belonged to the elites. They were able to, to pay for electronic goods, etc. But they weren't able, or say, the pink, during the pink tide, Brazil also wasn't able to significantly change the stratification of society in Brazil during the 2000s. This is the same wave that brought the Brazilian Workers' Party into power, with Lula and then Dilma Rousseff. This was until Operation Car Wash was launched and a huge corruption scandal broke in Brazil, throwing the entire political landscape of the country into chaos. Can you take us through what happened and what is Operation Car Wash? Just a broad story is that some investigators discovered that uh, there was a large-scale corruption going on in those state companies with kickbacks going on, etc. And a uh, considerable part of the political class earned money by um, funneling projects to those state companies. And it all... Um, there was lots of political activism from judges as well. So there was a, a task force. Uh, you, you, you might know of Sergio Moro, who led a task force of investigating all that. And those judges uh, 
they felt to be on a mission, I would say. So they felt that they would rid Brazil of corruption and thus cleanse the country of corruption and improve the country for good, etc. But they increasingly became, they increasingly thought, that's my impression, that they were standing above the law themselves. Attack, or they, that they wanted to achieve um, political damage for Lula and the PT. Uh, it was their um, goal of cho- their target of choice, so to say. Um, and although corruption was more widespread than just in the PT, um, it was clear that those prosecutors sought to get rid of Lula in the political contest and by making him ineligible elections. To summarize what was uncovered in Operation Car Wash, large-scale companies like Petrobras, the state Brazilian oil producer, and the ministers in charge of it would take large kickbacks from private companies like Udebrecht and many others. They formed a rotating cartel of companies who would pay money and in exchange be given huge government contracts, paying way over what they were worth. The companies would then kick back some of that extra money to the politicians to use on campaigns and personal finance, and the cycle would continue. The whole thing came to a head when many of these politicians and companies tried laundering their money through gas stations. The scandal was so wide-reaching it even brought down President Lula da Silva himself, who was remarkably popular at the time. Many of the big companies also had to pay large fines and lost many of the contracts they had bought the impacts of which reverberated financial problems throughout the region. But why did punishing Uldebrecht have such an impact on the Brazilian economy? Yeah, but the thing in car wash is that it uh, with Odebrecht, uh, it affected the big companies with deep ties to the state, um, which basically were rooted in the military regime because the military regime sought to build some national champions of the economy. Uh, in order to to broaden the cake, so to say. So they wanted to create some national champions of the economy that would uh, increase the GDP. And then from then on, they thought that they those champions would lead the country to further economic development. But that was actually the, the source of the deep entrenchment of the Brazilian state with those big companies, companies such as Odebrecht. And because those companies were affected by the car wash scandal, means meant that uh, the scandal actually had a big fallout to the entire Brazilian economy. Well, this raises a good question. With the military so tied into the Brazilian political landscape, will scales like this actually den them, especially with the current president, the far-right Jair Bolsonaro currently in power, who we're going to talk about a bit later. Will Bolsonaro tie his future to the military and keep the momentum going or will the momentum shift away and the military will start losing its ultimate grip over the power in Brazil? I think we're heading into an uncertain future. So there, there's certainly there's political protagonism of the military, which won't end anytime soon, whether Bolsonaro wins or not. So what we're currently seeing is that military generals try to position themselves as some sort of reasonable, conservative alternative to Bolsonaro. So they, again, try to paint themselves as the adults in the room. And I'm talking of reserve generals, which which not, not so subtly try to position themselves for important political roles in the future. So if Bolsonaro wins, I would say if Bolsonaro wins the next elections, um, the military will continue its heavy involvement in politics as currently. There might also be an option that a military officer takes part in a presidential ticket, either as a president or vice president, uh, the so-called third way, uh, which in the end is a conservative government with supposedly more reasonable military personnel involved as well. And I would, wouldn't would expect such a government to significantly roll back military influence in the next years. Then if the Workers' Party actually would win the election, uh, I wouldn't say it's far-fetched that we would see some sort of violence because Bolsonaro is very actively undermining confidence in the electoral inte- in the integrity of the electoral process. So you're running the risk of his hardcore supporters actually resorting to violence uh, after the elections in case the PT wins. And that 
could well lead to a severe institutional crisis, uh, which whose outcome is unknown to me. I mean, it would be mere speculation to think what happened if actually Bolsonaro lost the election in the runoff. So the healthy, the healthiest alternative or the healthiest path forward would be if Bolsonaro lost in the first round of the election and wouldn't even make the runoff, because that, in my opinion, would reduce the risk of political violence after the next elections. But even if the Workers' Party won the next elections, they would have a hard time to roll back military protagonism in society. So uh, in society and politics, that's uh, also a thing uh, that needs to be needs to be coming from the armed forces themselves. So if the generals don't um, concentrate on their task of defending the country and stop their involvement in politics from within their own ranks, I would say that we are going we're going to be seeing still a significant element of military protagonism in politics in the years to come. Brazil is a nation of contradictions. It has some of the most dense rainforests in all the world, but also some of the most dense housing per square kilometer in some of the big cities. It has some of the richest people in all of South America, but it also has some of the poorest. It relies heavily on the Amazon River, but doesn't have a single bridge that crosses the river. It was amazing watching the last Olympics in Brazil, and you could see these athletes cycling down brand new roads with shiny walls behind them, all whilst you knew that just on the other side of that wall lied the inner city flavelas. Areas where the government has no jurisdiction, and the guys with guns make the rules. Areas where the army and the police on many occasions don't dare go. But how do these favelas actually work? Obviously, they function as many people live in them. But what happens when you have absolutely no government interference? How do they end up? Well, to take us through that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. Pacification. A lot of people would say that uh, Rio de Janeiro is kind of the... Brazil of tomorrow, right? The the phenomenon that we're seeing uh, in Rio now is uh, an omen of what's to come in R Brazil more broadly, uh, which is not uh, an optimistic take to have uh, because the situation in, in Rio is quite dire now, uh, particularly, you know, the intertwine of, of politics and, and security, public safety and, and, and violence and how these things are intersecting in a very peculiar model to Rio de Janeiro that seems to be uh, expanding across Brazil. Uh, Rio de Janeiro is, is as uh, your audience probably already knows, it's a you know disproportionately important city in Rio if you consider the economic output, but it's just the, for a long time the was the capital, the actual capital, is, uh, arguably the cultural capital now. And uh, Rio de Janeiro never recovered from having n lost the the seat of government of Brazil, which was here in Rio, and then moved to a, a more central city in the country. And ever since then, Rio has been in a slow, uh, steady decline. But Victor Puji is an independent journalist formerly with the Interzeb Brazil, based in Rio de Janeiro. Victor has been writing for years on the geopolitical situation in Brazil and documenting what life on the ground is like there. He joins us today. Well, uh, it's definitely something that affects most of Brazil's major cities, but you can also uh, frame Rio as kind of having been the place, the, the ground zero where, where this particular sort of violence uh, began. So earlier on, we were talking a bit about the favelas. Can you explain what they are and how they work? Uh, that kind of goes for a long time. Uh, you can find the roots to what's going on uh, in very uh, important historical moments uh, that Brazil went through. So uh, what all started as a consequence of a, obviously a, a, a lack of adequate housing for most people, which meant that people had to kind of build below standard and uh, not well urbanized homes in places where were not that were not originally meant for housing 
uh, that created uh, uh, communities that are kind of like beyond the reach of government. Uh, by neglect, uh, the violence came after there was neglect. So uh, a lot of people would would kind of like invert the, the causation, which is to say that uh, some people would argue that there is no public services in these places because of the violence that won't let the these services get there. But uh, I would argue it's kind of uh, the ca causation is re reversed, right? The, the lack of public investment and in, of public services can be traced to the as one of the causes of the violence that we're seeing. And uh, the kind of violence there is, is very territorialized. So uh, specific territories, because Rio is a city in which, as opposed to many places around the world and arguably most places, the way Rio is organized geographically, we have, uh, as opposed to most cities in the world, the poor areas, these favelas, uh, are uh, intertwined with the rich areas as opposed to having a, a rich center and a poor periphery. Uh, so. Uh, these places are geographically huddled together, so uh, these poor communities, these favelas, are a lucrative base from which uh, to do your drug trafficking because you're already very close to the target consumer, which are rich people in rich neighborhoods. So, uh, you know, this can obviously be traced back to before uh, the lucrative drug markets. There were other, other kinds of crimes and other kinds of contravention that would... Uh, happen in these areas but with the war on drug and the militarization of the the fight against uh you know drug trafficking this is where when this uh which was more of a social problem in which uh the existence of very poor communities and and people in very dire situations in the middle of a, of a rich city became a more complicated one because you add the factor of violence armed violence uh and you know heavily armed gangs so what was a social problem became a problem of violence uh and this has been escalating uh ever since then so we have seen no solution although uh, every person in rio uh every politician who was elected is elected promising to to uh defeat the violence and obviously it still hasn't happened and and uh i would think that if we keep uh trying to use the same policies that have been tried, uh, it won't uh, get better anytime soon. With some of these favelas, they're quite big, and the biggest of which is how home to 100,000 people. How does governance work? Who's providing the power and water and collecting taxes? With no jurisdiction from the central government, how does the day-to-day -day life in these favelas actually take place? The idea being that, uh, in, you know, back, in the day, in the origin of this, it's just people that are uh, trying to get a new neighborhood and they're building their houses and kind of like knowing your neighbors and, and uh, things without the oversight the oversight of the state uh, occur kind of organically, right? Uh, but then we have, uh, as uh, drug trafficking starts to take hold in these commun communities, uh, these drug gangs kind of uh, start controlling uh, the territory. So uh, we have uh, these drug trafficking gangs, notably the Ride Command, which is a, a probably one of the largest here in Rio, but others as well, uh, which concentrate the, the the monopoly of violence in these territories where the state won't appear. But for a long time, uh, these drug trafficking gangs were somewhat disinterested in the day-to-day -day running of things. It was kind of like, as long as you wouldn't come in the way of their business, uh, things they, they wouldn't really care much. So they were much more in, interested in exerting territorial control and, and uh, maintaining control over the, the drug selling points in these territories, right? So recently, though, we've seen a troublesome phenomenon emerge, which is something that uh, I know that your uh, listeners will be familiar with a situation in Colombia with the paramilitary gangs. Uh, it's not dissimilar to that in the sense that there was this organizations of these in, you know, between scare quotes, self-defense units, right? What was framed as uh, people banding together to, to resist the criminal gangs, but obviously uh, is not so simple, right? Uh, these are in itself criminal gangs uh, with police officers or like off-duty police officers, 
you know, um, petty mil military officers also, uh, you know, freelancing as this thing. Uh, so they become uh, these uh, paramilitary gangs that uh, exist in opposition to the drug trafficking gangs. And they uh, are much more interested in the day-to-day -day running of things. They, they run much more like a mafia than, they, than these uh, drug trafficking gangs do. Uh, so they have, for example, control over uh, the garbage collecting system. Uh, they will uh, collect protection taxes from people who live there. They will uh, collect taxes from business owners like people who have uh, small stores and, and restaurants and things like that. You have to pay a, a tax to them. They uh, sell uh, services like uh, cable TV, like pirated cable TV, uh, all, all sort of things. So what, what we see recently is the emergence of these uh, militia gangs that are not at all like these drug trafficking gangs of, of uh, previous times. Uh, they These militias first come about with the logic of, uh, you know, being doing law enforcement if law enforcement isn't here. So uh, they would exist in opposition to the drug traffickers. They would not want crime to occur. But obviously, uh, they have kind of uh, changed into a gang themselves. So uh, now them, now we see a lot of them, of these militias that are themselves involved in drug trafficking. Uh, we see that they are controlling more and more territory. And what is worrying is because as opposed to these drug trafficking gangs, uh, they are politically organized. They have uh, links with the actual state and uh, they have a, a power building project. So they will elect candidates and and run for office and, and have um, uh, someone, people in political positions uh, looking for their interests. And Bolsonaro is very much a, a product of this uh, universe. Uh, he has very demonstrable ties with these uh, militias and these paramilitary gangs. He's heavily supported by them. His core constituency of uh, police officers and, and uh, army officers, you know, petty army officers, uh, is the bread and butter of these, of these militia gangs. And uh, we're seeing these militias asserting more and more of themselves and, and being more and more willing to uh, use coercive power in more and more daring ways. Uh, in particular, uh, the murder of a, of a city councilwoman here in Rio, a, a very, very interesting person uh, who was a left-wing city councilwoman here in Rio de Janeiro. Her name was Marielle Franco. She was murdered by these militias in a crime that uh, shocked the world and, and shocked Rio. And the fact that they were daring enough to kill an acting city councilwoman shows how they are more and more comfortable and they are gaining more and more power all around the city and the country as well. So back in 2008, the central government of Brazil wanted to finally do something about these favelas by sending in tanks and armored policemen to retake control of the areas by force through a process called pacification. Can you take us through the process of pacification as well as whether or not it was actually successful? It was very obviously not successful uh, I, because, you know, violence is still, still is happening. So, But it wasn't... Uh, uh, a proposed solution that that for uh, for a while uh, was very popular because people uh, you know it seemed like it could work uh, because for a lot of the time these these there is no public policy to to kind of fight this problem of of you know violence and and, and lack of state control of the over these territories and what usually happens is that like uh, there is this uneasy arrangement and where kind of everyone knows that this territory is, is controlled by criminals, but there's nothing anyone could do or, or you know, it exists in this uh, unhealthy equilibrium. But then, you know, usually like maybe some rich teenager would be killed in this favela or maybe there are like some particular crime would, would shock people. Or maybe like there's a video of like open air, like drug dealing in the like middle of the day that, makes it to the newspapers and then everyone's shocked and then 
there would be like the the governor would send like the police and then the police would go in there kill a bunch of people with no trial like just do uh brute senseless violence uh to kind of like discipline it and then pretend like something's happening but obviously nothing's happening like the criminals that would be killed uh uh you know by the next day the, the criminal gangs will have reorganized themselves and, and have new people in these positions and essentially nothing would change except for a, a momentary outburst of violence the idea with this pacification was that uh the police would come and and uh invade and 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 gain control of a territory and that they would remain and then they would bring in public services and then like they would uh reorganize like the the school system they would uh open like education centers co cultural centers uh the idea being that they would uh maintain the territorial control not just by force but by the social uh, programs of that the state usually were uh run and and you know maintain a, a long-term presence in these territories the issue was of course uh that the bit in which they invade and 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 the police occupy was done, but the bit in which they bring in the social services and, uh, you know, school and, and all the, the public goods, uh, that bit didn't quite come through. So uh, it ended up being just kind of more of the same. But there's obviously uh, other problems in there. The decision in which favelas would be pacified was made not uh, according to some strategic plan or or some more logical way but the decision to which favelas would be subjected to pacification and, and would go through this program was not made uh, technically or, or according to a, a strategic plan or scheme but it was usually uh, following the economic interests of the tourist industry so uh, it was uh, usually in the tourism corridor of the beaches these favelas would receive that uh, but not much else. And obviously, uh, because of the political power of the militias in the city and and their uh, power within the police forces of Rio, they would also hardly ever uh, do this pacification in any militia-occupied areas, only in the drug, drug trafficking-occupied areas. So it was kind of, in a way, ended up fighting the enemies of the militias. And then when this program faded away... Now uh, we see that the militias are gaining even, even more power because uh, their enemies have kind of like been, been weakened severely. But I think that these pacification program was kind of like the last time that there was a, at least a unified consensus of what was being done, even though the solution was, was not adequate. You know, a lot of people could say you from day, could, tell, could have told you from day one uh, that this wasn't going to work. So uh, the logic was that they would finally occupy the territories and, and finally break the, the territorial control that these criminal gangs had over these places. But uh, what we're seeing is that it didn't do that and uh, it planted seeds of, of pessimism in uh, a lot of the population. Now, we definitely shouldn't assume the police went in lightly as they never do in Brazil. In fact, statistically, one in every 23 arrests in Brazil ends in a death. Way above the United States, which is at one in every 11,000 ending in a death. What makes these situations so deadly? And are the police really that brutal? Yes, very much so. Uh -huh. um, and it's not a recent phenomenon or uh, surprising but Brazilian police is extremely violent and has been for years. And, and the, there's a, a lot of, of popularity to the idea that the, the police should just go around killing a bunch of people. Um, we have this idea of Brazil as a very peaceful country because uh, of uh, very little involvement in, in foreign wars so to speak, and, and, and things like that. But a lot of the wars in Brazilian history have been fought internally against its own population. And what we're seeing is, is an extension of that. Uh, yeah, Brazilian police is extremely violent. Uh, it, it has a, a negligible uh, rate of solving crimes and investigation and intelligence. It acts mostly and almost exclusively 
with uh, repressive force uh, and very little else. Uh, obviously, they this violence is distributed unevenly uh, against poor, usually black, and usually uh, living in these uh, favelas, uh, young men mostly, and. And what we're seeing is that uh, now the violence is so widespread, becoming more and more common as uh, we're seeing children getting shot in the crossfires of, of things like that. So there was a recent operation in uh, a favela here in Rio uh, that for which, you know, there was no strategic justification. The, the, the police did a uh, an interview later and they weren't able to explain what was the point of the operation but uh you know they just went in one of these favelas killed a bunch of people uh said you know oh no all the people that were killed were, were, were drug traffickers and and you know no no need to show any proof of anything no need to to go to trial we can just um, kill whoever we want but the, the the issue is that there is these operations are are popular because people are very tired of, of violence and and the logic being that uh you know the police says they killed the criminals that make my life miserable then uh, i'm all for it right even though that uh, we know that this solution i mean this doesn't solve crime i know of no country where you know there was a problem with crime and, and then you know they were able to to overcome it by distributing gratuitous violence um uh, Brazil incarcerates a lot of people. We have a huge uh, carceral population. Uh, the prison population exploded in the recent years, uh, and these prison, this, the prison system has become kind of a the university of crime. Right, uh, people who who go sent got get sent to prison uh, for low offenses, uh, you know, small things. They are are, are sent to prison. Um, sometimes even before having been convicted, before trial, like the, and um, they're thrown in an environment very violent, uh, surrounded by people who are criminals, and and uh, you kind of like you get into prison, you have to join a, a gang to so that you can maintain your safety while in there. So, what happens is that a lot of first find, first time offenders get sent to prison, and then uh, while in prison they they join a gang and. and uh, so kind of like the problem just expands. But yes, uh, Brazilian police is extremely violent. So the man who consistently talks up the police and encourages these kinds of indiscriminate violent acts against cartels is current Brazilian president Jair Bolsonaro. Can you give us a bit of a rundown on who this man is and why he is such a controversial figure in international politics? All right. So Bolsonaro is very much a Rio de Janeiro creature. Uh, this is where he made his political career, made his life and, and a name for himself. Uh, he was first elected in 1988, uh, where he was uh, elected for the, the position of city councilman here in Rio, which is kind of like the lowest uh, rung in the, in the ladder, in the power ladder of Brazilian politics. Uh, he was uh, in the army before that. He was a, a, a parachuter. And he was never considered to be a very good soldier by his superiors. Uh, he was, uh, there was like internal reports from the army, uh, documents uh, relating to his time in the army that uh, say that uh, he was not uh, a very good soldier. He was uh, excessively focused on enriching himself financially. But he was uh, a corporatist, right? He was... Uh, very attuned to the demands of the category of, of petty officers and, and, and what their uh, particular demands were. So in 1988, after he had already left the army for indiscipline, and uh, there's a famous episode in which he planned a, a terrorist attack to put a, a bomb in, a, in you know, a piece of, of, of water infrastructure in the city as a, to agitate for better, better pay for, for uh, petty officers in the army, uh, ended up uh, being the, the, the source of his uh, leaving the army, this, this uh, you know, essentially terrorist attack that he was planning. Uh, but, you know, uh, so with the name that he made for himself in the army as someone who was uh, defending the interests of the petty officers and, and, and the lower soldiers, 
uh, he ran for uh, city council here in Rio and he was elected. And he quickly uh, ran for federal uh, congressperson, for federal congressman, uh, two years later. And, you know, his uh, constituency was police officers and uh, army officers. And his whole uh, thing was, uh, you know, getting better salaries or better benefits for, for, for these categories uh, and, and, and these sectors. Uh, but, you know, uh, from 1990, he was elected a uh, federal congress congressman and he kind of like languished in there. Uh, he had his uh, constituency, uh, but he didn't really do much politically as a congressman, didn't p pass many laws, uh, didn't really join many of the of the debates. He was just there almost as a celebrity and he was also there uh, basically uh, supported by by his core constituency uh, although he he got uh, expressive uh, votes so he was more and more making a name for himself and he was giving this these interviews bombastic interviews in which he's just uh, totally unhinged making extremely uh, controversial to put it mildly I would argue uh, he was also always making these uh, racist and uh, homophobic and uh, honestly anti-democratic statements. He uh, has agitated for the return of the military dictatorship. He has given interviews uh, saying that he is nostalgic for the for the military uh, times. Uh, he he's gave a, a very famous interview in which he says that he, his only criticism of uh, the military dictatorship was that, that they tortured, but they didn't kill. Uh, they shouldn't have left so many people into exile, should have killed them all. Uh, and, you know, basically saying that we're only going to solve the problem in Brazil uh, when we start killing thousands of people. Uh, so he was in these in this uh, position of, of being a congressman with guaranteed constituency and, and, and you know, uh, well known uh, outside of, of of political, he was well known outside of, of political circles, but internally within Congress he was isolated. He didn't have many uh, friends, and and he didn't do much uh, of relevance. Bolsonaro came to power in Brazil after Lula became disqualified to run for president, and he won a narrow victory on a law and order, religious base, tough on crime, make Brazil great platform. How has his term been so far for Brazil? Uh, well, he was uh, elected and, and his first pitch was that he was uh, an anti-politics guy. He wouldn't do uh, the usual negotiation with, with politicians. And, and he was uh, very much surfing the anti-politics wave that, that was uh, taking over Brazil. He also brought uh, the military into the government in an unprecedented way. Uh, there are more military people in government now than there was than there were during the military dictatorship. And uh, his main thing was that he would not negotiate with the usual blob of uh, Congress people who are just always there and they just usually just go with whoever is in government. Uh, and, you know, extracting concessions and kind of like trying to get control of the of all the money to distribute uh, the pork uh, to their bases. And, and Bolsonaro's first, first speech was that first pitch was that he would not uh, do politics as usual. But now uh, that he is in trouble, he has basically uh, given the keys and the control of his government to these uh politicians, traditional politicians who govern in these uh, quid pro quo ways. Uh, this is usually called the centrão, uh, like the big center, uh, which I, I, I think a, a, a similar, a, a, an interesting image to think of them. It's kind of like, like people talk of the blob in the US. Uh, and of course, it's referring to something different, but it's just a, an amorphous group that is just always in power, regardless of who's in power. But COVID kind of threw sand into his machine because uh, he had to govern with COVID. So uh, it was when uh, the government needed to, to take action and was expected to take action. And he is uh, 
incapable of uh, proactively governing. He's very good at, at criticizing and, and, you know, tearing things down, but he's uh, has a very hard time building up. Uh, so first, with a disastrous uh, response to the COVID crisis, Brazil is one of the worst affected countries in, in the world. Uh, a very haphazard and, and, and badly run vaccination program. Brazil uh, had been for, for a lot of time a leader, a, a global leader in, in vaccination programs and, and had uh, was known for, for its efficient vaccinate, vaccination system. Brazil has a universal health system uh, that, you know, although underfunded and, and full of problems is, is, is you know, runs well and, and has expertise with uh, infectious diseases. But uh, Brazil squandered totally the the, the COVID crisis. Uh, did not uh, use at all the expertise uh, because basically Bolsonaro was just boycotting everything because he feared uh, being uh, made unpopular by by this crisis. Um, uh, the one thing that he could say is that you know oh I'm not corrupt or that he would try to claim. Uh, and now he's losing even that. Uh, although, uh, as we're seeing now, uh, we can confidently say with uh, the evidence that is coming out now and, and that people have been able to collect is that he has been running uh, corrupt schemes in his office ever since he was elected. Uh, usually, uh, it's a, a very... Uh, common corrupt scheme that is run here in, in, in Brazil, but that Bolsonaro and, and his sons have like taken to the next level, which is basically a, a hiring fake employees. So if you're elected to Congress, you have a budget and you get to hire like a few uh, aides. Uh, let's say like, oh, you here you have like 10,000 reais to hire uh, two aides. But then what they would do is that they would, uh, you know, contact their friends and then their friends would put their name down. Uh, the guy would get the salary without actually working and then kick the salary back to, to, to Bolsonaro, right? So uh, I get to hire you as a fake employee of your 5,000 uh, salary. You get to keep one, you give me back 4,000. And, you know, it's good for you because you get 1,000 without having to do any work. It's good for me because I get, uh, you know, free money basically uh and what we're seeing is that uh he has been running this in his and all of his kids's office uh, ever since he was elected and uh, it turns out that he was uh the person who controlled hiring in his kids's officers off in the office of his kids uh as uh elected politicians and basically this is uh you know, it has been demonstrated now that he's been doing these uh, petty corruption uh, ever since he, he first came to, to politics. I think there's one aspect that, that kind of I've neglected to mention, which is the the fact that, you know, uh, his government, as I said, is uh, heavily militarized. There's a lot of uh, military people in it. And uh, with these corruption investigations, they are also finding... Uh, you know, evidence of corruption by uh, military officers, both, uh, you know, generals like high up, as well as uh, petty uh, small time officers and uh, being exposed as corrupt uh, has made the, the military uh, very uncomfortable and they have been making threatening noises against the institutions and, uh, you know, Kind of like insinuating that uh, unless something changed, they would uh, have to quote unquote do something, which uh, in a country that is so plagued with military coups and, and military dictatorships, as is Brazil, and Brazilian history is uh, basically a history of military coups, uh, is very, very uh, worrying, uh, a very worrying sign. Brazil may have conflicts in its own territories, but what about overseas? Brazil shares land borders with all but two of the South American nations and has been at war with almost all of them throughout history at some point. But what is the country's policy today? How will they tackle the refugee crisis unfolding in Venezuela to the north? 
or the financial crisis blooming in Argentina to the south? Well, to answer that, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. The Heavy Crown Uh, The joke has always been uh, that Brazil is the next global power and always will be. Uh, And indeed, that pretty much, as cruel as that may sound, has always pretty much marked uh, Brazil's cycles. Um, It, it, you know, given its size, uh, given its diversity, given the fact that that with the exception of some very notable exceptions of of dictatorship, it's been primarily a democracy uh, and the strength of its economy um, it, you know, it has always had global aspirations. In fact, it felt uh, left out because it was not included in the UN Security Council uh, permanent members when that was created after post-World War II. Um, but it has never uh, made it. And part of that is also the, uh, the boom and bust of the Brazilian economy uh, that has marked it now for, for centuries. Uh, but also um, the fact that it's never been a consistent policy of the state to uh, uh, assert its role globally. Christopher Sabatini is a senior fellow specializing in Latin America for the London-based think tank Chatham House. He's also the former editor of the Global Americans and the founder of the independent publication America's Quarterly. We are thrilled to have Chris Sabatini back on the show today. Uh, And that really started to change a little bit, um, but in a way that wasn't entirely positive under the Lula administration when Brazil became sort of the darling of, of the, the world. Lula was the most popular politician in the world, as President, then President Obama called him. Yeah, the brand Brazil was, was really hot. Disney even made a movie called Rio. Um, you know, Brazilian products, not just the samba, but products uh, like Embraer jets were really cracking uh, new markets. Uh, and Brazil was leading the developed world. And so that was very much, and it, it, it's sort of moment uh, and it really saw itself as, as leading um, the developing world into not just its own place, but also the developing world to get a seat at the table, and in part becoming somewhat the self-appointed spokesperson of that developing world in matters of trade, in matters of the international financial system, in matters of, of the UN and multilateral uh, organizations. Um, but that really all came apart with the election. Well, primarily with the falling apart of, of uh, the Lula government and uh, then and later Dilma Rousseff government. Um, and now it's, it's really um, a, a, a damaged brand uh, internationally and just in terms of public image because of Jair Bolsonaro uh, and his rather intemperate uh, uh, pr- presidency, let's say. But also this is uh, Jair Bolsonaro is, is very much a Trump like president in that he believes in Brazil first, and that has placed uh, Brazil's foreign policy in the back burner, but also its uh, global ambitions at the, on the back foot. Um, but again, while clearly the Bolsonaro government was a clear market dividing line, um, it had already become a damaged brand. Uh, and so it, its global ambitions uh, for now are, are, are you know, deep in the closet. We'll have to see where it goes. Brazil has always been heavily involved in the business of many of the South American nations, with Brazilian companies doing business all over Latin America. With these corruption scandals breaking, though, and the seeming new wave of instability in the Brazilian economy, do you think other Latin American nations might be hesitant to work with Brazil as much going forward? Uh, This goes to the point I was saying earlier about uh, how damaged Brazil has become as a brand and all those uh, sort of symbols of Brazil's uh, um, imminent arrival as a global power. Uh, two of those are Petrobras and, and um, uh, Odebrecht, the construction company, and the first being the uh, semi-state oil company. Um, those were at the center of, of car wash scandal, and they're deeply, deeply damaged. And in those cases, the um, what's interesting is, is really uh, both of those companies, especially Odebrecht formed, if you will, sort of a, a union with the federal government in its foreign policy under the, the Lula administration uh, in places like Cuba and places like Africa, where uh, one of the heads of, of Odebrecht was his brother was head of the uh, African ministry, sub ministry in, in uh, um, the uh, foreign ministry of Brazil. And so it was really kind of a, a weird collusion between state foreign policy and um, uh, government 
in, in, let's say, encouraged um, private investment. And it wasn't all that investment. You had large, the large uh, um, Brazilian development bank, Bandeese, basically underwriting a lot of this. Uh, as you mentioned, Cuba, Mexico, Peru, Dominican Republic, Odebrecht, and the um, foreign ministry in Brazil worked hand in hand. And now, as we see with the car wash scandal <clears throat> that you talked about, what we see is, um, you know, this this corruption tainted not just Odebrecht and, and the Brazilian uh, elite and foreign ministry, but also a lot of the uh, local officials in those countries were invested. Peru, Dominican Republic, um, Haiti have all been caught up in these uh, Odebrecht corruption scandals, Chile. Um, and so, you know, it, it has really weakened uh, Brazil's moral authority and weaken in some ways what I think was taken as a um, the central pillar of Brazil's foreign policy strategy and its uh, soft power uh, globally. And that's now damaged. Historically, Brazil's main competitor in South America was always Argentina, who itself was once a powerhouse economy of the region. Even today, due to a lot of the river flows, Brazilian goods actually travel downstream into Argentina before they make it to an Argentinian port and then onto the global markets. But what is the relationship like between Brazil and Argentina these days? So, you know, the, the Argentine-Brazilian uh, relationship has always been fraught. Uh, in fact, you know, it was um, through the intervention of the, the United Kingdom uh, Great Britain at the time that um, created uh, the buffer state of Uruguay to try to sort of hold them and, and, and to assert sort of U.S. Uh, I'm sorry, U.K. Uh, uh, sort of brokering power within the region, and that has remained as a, just a, the nature of ge geologic, geographic rather competition, geopolitical competition. What's happened increasingly, and, 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 and economic competition has increased overall as well. When despite the fact that both both countries, along with Peru, I'm sorry, Paraguay and Uruguay, entered Mercosur to the common market of the Southern Cone. Um, Brazil really uh, uh, was the the large player in that. And when Argentina devalued its currency uh, in the early 2000s, after the collapse of the uh, currency board, the dollarized economy, Brazil paid dearly because it's uh, it had tied very much its manufacturing. Uh, exports to the Argentine market, the suddenly the devaluation sent those exports um, skyrocketing uh, in, pro in local uh, Argentine uh, pesos. So it was very much hurt by that. And, and that, in fact, just pointed to first the, the, the inherent economic competition as well as the inherent weakness of Mercosur, that there is no coordinating factor or body uh, in Mercosur and even between Argentina and Brazil to be able to control for uh, these fluctuations in, in uh, economic policy, as well as in that case, monetary policy. So that added another element, uh, in addition to the geopolitical competition, the economic competition. And now what you see uh, in ways that didn't exist before is a political competition, or even partisan competition. Uh, Argentina, 2019, elected a, a Peronist uh, president. Um, and in the days of the Lula government, um, Lula worked very closely with uh, the former Peronist government, first Nestor Kirchner and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. But um, in this case, under Alberto Fernandez, the, the current president of Argentina, he clashed very um, uh, violently, actually, and, uh, at least rhetorically speaking, with Jair Bolsonaro, who was uh, a nationalist, uh, a, a, a really deep uh, conservative, even a conspiracy theorist, in which he didn't even attend Alberto Fernandez's inauguration in Argentina, something that's unheard of. And so that's added a new dimension in this um, Argentine-Brazilian competition that really hadn't existed before. And I think it's going to be very difficult because what it demonstrates is, again, is this fractioning of, of this um, foreign policy as a policy of state of Brazil. Again, in much the same way Trump, uh, the Trump administration in the United States did the same thing. And despite differences between Republicans and Democrats, there's always a certain core to that foreign policy. That has evaporated um, right now in the United States and certainly also in, in Brazil. And so you know, the question is, is you know, if, the, if parties, party governments are not aligned within Mercosur, within the region, you know, is a government of, of, by Jair Bolsonaro willing to, to co cooperate with them? And it, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. The other major problem bubbling away in South America is Venezuela, who could implode at some point in the future, with many side effects from that flowing into the areas around Brazil's sparse northwest. 
what is Brazil's strategy toward Venezuela? Do you think they're looking to intervene or will they just try and leave it alone and avoid kicking that hornet's nest? You know, it's difficult to say. The um, you know, I, I will say during the uh, the years of the PT government in Brazil, uh, it, it turned a, a blind eye to the uh, human rights abuses uh, of then President Hugo Chavez and later Nicolas Maduro, um, and and indeed, you know, they they uh, in fact engaged in a policy of, of attempting to co-opt the government, recognizing that it was problematic, but attempting to co-opt it by bringing it into, into multilateral organizations such as Mercosur and Unisur. Uh, and now Jair Bolsonaro has gone in the exact opposite direction. You know, it's almost like that scene in Spinal Tap uh, where um, Nigel, Nigel Lofgren says that his amplifier goes up to 11. Uh, you know, that's exactly what Jair Bolsonaro did. He, he took Brazilian foreign policy towards uh, Venezuela up to 11 uh, instead of just making 10 louder. Uh, and that's had a problem because it, it it's become so sharply partisan that it's going to be difficult for Brazil to play much of a broker role when there is a change of government in, in uh, Venezuela. And even if Venezuela should collapse, and it effectively is collapse, but should it collapse in open political conflict, Brazil is going to have a very difficult um, uh, time playing any sort of constructive role in that. The same could be said of the United States, but that's uh, over a long time. And, it, and in fact... The problem now is you know, Venezuela is a regional problem, has been a regional problem. Uh, and in fact, it should be dealt with regionally, given you know, the, the almost six million uh, uh, Venezuelan refugees who have fled, given the uh, dramatic contraction of the economy of you know, two thirds of it has effectively evaporated um, and the needs to rebuild that country when the time comes institutionally, infrastructure wise, politically. Um, Brazil would be a natural partner in doing that. Um, but in fact, it, it, it really can't. And, and because Bolsonaro has been so sharp and so partisan, and to be honest, you know, even if Lula should be elected in 2022, um, and it's not clear, it's going to be difficult for, for Lula to engage in a more moderate policy as well. I, I fear that the, the two poles of this approach to Venezuela are very much set, given the polarization uh, within the country. And, and there are real security concerns for Brazil. And there were even under the Lula government. You know, the, a lot of the, the border area between Brazil and Venezuela is, is very porous borders, um, uh, marked often by jungle, uh, really um, unpatrolled, under controlled areas, um, and which there's been a, a large spike in, in uh, refugee settlements of Venezuelans that in some cases has generated a backlash by, by Brazilians, uh, residents who feel they've taken jobs and land. Um, but there's also been allegations of um, of um, there being greater uh, narcotics trafficking across the Venezuela, because Venezuela has effectively become a narco state, as you and I have discussed, Michael. Uh, and, and now that is sort of filling the vacuum of the ungoverned space in that border. And so there are plenty of security reasons there. Brazil has been focusing a lot of its international efforts on trading with West African nations at the moment. Can you take us a little bit through this and why Brazil would focus on this region of the world? Brazil actually has very close relations with Africa, and that was part of the the, um, the Lula government's initiative, I think, very strongly. It was, um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, government really sought to become uh, the representative, self-appointed in some ways, of underdeveloped and developing countries uh, on, on a range of issues, trade, investment, what have you. And part of that was um, building... Brazil's diplomatic and economic footprint uh, across the global south. And as a result, uh, Brazil actually, I, I believe it opened up more embassies than many um, developed countries had around the world. Most of those were in the global south. Uh, most of those were in Africa. The uh, Lula government started to sponsor scholarships for Angolans to come study in Brazilian universities. Um, according to some reports, Angolan students were shocked by the level of racism uh, in Brazil, and indeed it does exist. And Brazil has for a long time been in denial of that. Um, but it, it was Brazil invested heavily in, in that idea of itself as a, as a um, broker between the global south and the developed north. Well, if we're talking about Brazil and investments, we have to talk about China. Beijing is putting large amounts of investment capital into Brazilian land and products at the moment. But where do you see that relationship going in the meantime? When Jair Bolsonaro was running for the presidency, he was very critical of China and his um, 
foreign minister Raus um, was uh, Rajo, sorry, uh, was um, uh, very critical of China and, and, and communism and, and very outspoken about that. Uh, what what happened though when um, Bolsonaro came to power is he realized he couldn't afford to be. China is Brazil's number one trade partner. Uh, it consumes a large uh, number of Brazilian uh, um, uh, primary products, primarily uh, agriculture, beef, chicken, soy, uh, as well as iron ore uh, and oil. Um, and simply, he, the Bolsonaro government ran into the opposition of, of um, Brazilian exporters and business leaders uh, to taking any sort of hardline stance on China. Because of the momentum of uh, the economic relationship between Brazil and China, and also because of the momentum uh, of investment, uh, China has pledged, it's pledged more than it's delivered, but it's had it's delivered some, but it's pledged a large amount of investment um, in infrastructure in Brazil, which Brazil sorely needs. Um, railways, ports, roads. Um, now, China's interest in doing that is mostly to get uh, products that China needs to import from uh, the hinterland or the interior of Brazil to Brazilian ports. Um, but, you know, that, that, that is deeply necessary would improve Brazil's comparative advantage. So they're not going to walk away from that either. So I don't see, you know, maybe, you know, Jair Bolsonaro may, may talk loudly, but he carries a pretty small stick. Uh, when it comes to changing China policy, and that certainly won't change in any future government, um, especially now as we see uh, post-COVID, Brazil's um, export economy beginning to boom again, again, mostly in primary products, again, mostly in agriculture, but again, mostly because of Chinese demand. Now, Chinese demand is not going to reach the levels that it had in the early 2000s um, because simply its growth rates are not going to top out as much as high as it did then. Um, but it's going to uh, provide a very powerful pull, and because of that, a very powerful lobby within Brazil to maintain very stable, um, if you will, uh, if not neutral, then I mean, if not pro-Chinese, then neutral relations when it comes to the, the increasing competition between the United States and China. Well, can you go into the relationship between the United States and Brazil? You know, is it getting closer? Is it pushing further away? And and with the previous period where Bolsonaro and Trump were in, in power at the same time, did that draw the United States and Brazil much closer together with the two leaders having similar ideological feelings? Again, yeah, the, Bolsonaro called himself a tropical Trump and people like to compare him to Donald Trump. And it, it's a it's a fair comparison at many different levels, including um, uh, temperament. Uh, but it's also a good comparison in terms of Bolsonaro's own lack of interest in foreign policy. Um, he is, you know, um, for whatever reason, he is more concerned about domestic politics and his constituency than he is in, in uh, projecting uh, Brazil's global ambitions and power uh, regionally or globally. Uh, so if the United States, um, you know, seeks a more active role in Latin America, I don't think um, uh, Bolsonaro will, um, you know, depends what, if, if, say, a future Donald Trump presidency were to do it, maybe Bolsonaro would would tuck in behind him and, and support, as, as it did in terms of the um, sending back Cuban doctors from Brazil uh, when he came to power, uh, as it, it did in terms of the, the um, right now, the very uh, powerful rhetoric about the uprisings in Cuba. Um, it, you know, it may... They may echo U.S. Uh, interests, and, and you know, and the, it, Brazil also supported the very controversial Trump nominee to the Inter-American Development Bank, Mauricio Claver Caron. So that'll help them on the margins. Um, so in that case, you know, there, if there's a certain Trump Bolsonaro affinity, I don't think um, when it comes to a Biden presidency, there's. Uh, yeah, I don't think Bolsonaro would oppose Biden in many of his cases on Latin America. Um, I, I just don't think he cares that much about foreign policy. Um, you know, I think if there's going to be any friction between uh, President Joe Biden and uh, Jair Bolsonaro, it will come over uh, questions of the environment, protecting the Amazon. We've all s seen him sort of uh, rankle at the uh, uh, French President Macron's uh, comments about the Amazon, which were in, in politic, to be honest. Um, and that, that friction may come. And when it comes to China, you know, it, it's, 
as long as Bolsonaro is there, you know, and I don't think the Biden administration is is all that concerned about the economics of the relationship between China and uh, uh, Brazil um, in terms of when it comes to just trade, maybe investment, but the Biden administration is trying to offer up something else uh, as it came out of the G7 meeting in Cornwall in England uh, earlier this year. Um, but I don't really see it being the front lines. The only exception is is the 5G, Huawei 5G issue. Um, and in that, that case, the Trump administration tried to offer some very lame, thin inducements to get Brazil not to reject uh, um, uh, Huawei's offers to upgrade the 5G network in, in to the 5G up network in, in Brazil. Um, but I don't I don't see um, the U.S. necessarily picking a fight over that uh, in a way that would get um, Bolsonaro's spine up, back up. Um, and and I, as I say, I think most of the core interests of Brazil right now are in the economics. With the changes happening to the Brazilian economy at the moment, do you think we're likely to see a bounce back of the economic status in Brazil over the next five years? Or are we likely to see a more elongated stagnation like in Argentina? Well, let me break out my crystal ball here, Michael. Um, and I would say um, I think it will get better. Um, I think we're already seeing signs of growth. Brazil will probably come out in 2021, one of the fastest growing, except for maybe Peru um, and maybe Chile, one of the fastest growing economies uh, in the region above uh, the originally predicted 3% growth uh, average on the region. Brazil may be up around 4 maybe even a little higher. Um, that's important, and I think we'll probably continue to grow again. Again, But it's going. the problem is this, is it's going to continue to grow along its traditionally strong uh, um, primary product export base. Uh, Brazil has always been a very closed economy. Um, relative to other countries in the region, it, it receives far less uh, percent of its GDP from exports than do other countries. Now, part of that is because Brazil is such a large uh, country uh, and market. Part of it's also because it's had a very, um, let's say, generous uh, state subsidy program in a number of areas, including through its state development bank, um, which some of which has been rolled back. Um, but what that means is that unless uh, any future government, whether it's Bolsonaro's or Lula's, does more to invest productivity in Brazil, which lags well behind much of um, the developed world, uh, and does more to try to open up developed country markets, and then the Mercosur uh, EU trade deal, should it come to pass, would help tremendously, um, it will still be hostage to um, the uh, limited economic gains, uh, both in terms of broad-based economic growth and in terms of uh, stable, uh, um, broad-based uh, growth within the country and outside beyond, uh, you know, not being able to access manufacturing and other sort of value-added industries. Um, it will uh, probably be able to top out around 4 or 5%, but that will remain where it stays. Uh, and also then it also remains that it will be very much a uh, hostage to uh, any uh, economic vicissitudes in the, in the market and demand for primary products. So it will grow. I don't think it will take the necessary steps to increase productivity. Um, it will remain a dynamic and diverse economy, but not sufficiently dynamic and not sufficiently productive and not sufficiently diverse to be able to punch through its status as a middle income power to really join uh, one of the uh, developed world's more uh, powerful industrialized or, or now service based or computer based economies. Brazil's future was once described to me as a bowl of M&Ms that someone placed a handful of Skittles into. That all of the ingredients for something amazing are right there, but they just need to sort a few things out before you can just start eating from the bowl safely. Brazil has huge amounts of land for agriculture, but also have to work out a way of using it without destroying the delicate ecosystem. They have these bustling, people-driven communities in the heart of their major cities, but they don't have the ability to actually conquer and assimilate them. And even if they did, does the central government have the administration in place to be able to handle all these new people? 
They have all these amazing internal waterways around with the Amazon River that are great for easy transport. But there's very little support and infrastructure out that way to make them fully feasible. All the pieces to the Brazilian puzzle are right there. They just need to be able to solve it for themselves and then take their rightful place as a world power. Thank you so much for shooting into the show this week. It's been another busy week here at the Red Line office with our latest round of the geopolitics pub quiz and preparing to release a brand new analysis piece as well. We're very excited about the bunch of new extra content and briefings we have in the pipeline for you guys at the moment. So thank you so much for tuning in and just keeping this whole machine going. If you want to check out our new bonus content for yourself or ask questions, you can get in contact with us via any of our social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and as of this week, TikTok on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you want to find me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Hilly at Oz. Oz is in Australia. As I say every time, this show would not be possible without the support of our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each week to help us keep this show going. Our Patreons who get to join in on games nights and live Q&As, and also get extra materials from the show. And our Patreon donations all go 100% back into the program, helping us pay for staff, programs, hosting, websites, and lawyers that are essential for running a show like this. I cannot thank our current Patreons nearly enough for your support and for your attendance at all our events. And if you feel like you can spare a couple of dollars a week, we would really, really appreciate it. As usual, here are our three book recommendations if you want to take your research in this subject even further. The first is Aspirational Power, Brazil on the Long Road to Global Influence by David R. Mares, which is an amazing book documenting Brazil's regional rise. The second is Participatory Democracy in Brazil, Socioeconomic and Political Origins by J. Ricardo Tranjan, for a look at how the internal politics of Brazil works. And the third is Brazil, the United States and the South American Subsystem by Carlos Gustavo Porgio Telezeria for a wider regional look at South America. I want to thank our guests this week, Christopher Haraj, Victor Puji, and Christopher Sabatini. It was great to finally get a chance to work with Christoph and Victor, and it was also amazing to have Chris Sabatini back on the program for a third time. I also want to thank the staff here at the show, Owen Swift, the producer, Perry Grace and Daniela Zivella, research assistants and writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Munch, our field correspondent. I'm incredibly proud of this team and what they've all done here at the show, and I think we can see why. The last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show, and I honestly can't begin to thank you enough for all the support you guys have shown us, particularly since over the last month. Watching so many of you get in contact with me and send me emails and requests to hang out has really been amazing. And I met so many amazing people over the last two weeks. So once again, thank you for reaching out to the show and helping us keep this thing going. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.